Hello, everybody. Hi. 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 Uh, what, is today round four? Are we at our fourth lecture on statistics? This is kind of exciting stuff. You know, next week we actually get to some of the things that people think statistics is all about, like t-tests and so on. But I thought it would be worthwhile, having talked about uh, correlation last week, to talk about a subject very closely related to that, linear models. So uh, I'm going to try to make this topic just as approachable as I can, and we'll, we'll get there. So uh, let us move ahead to the next slide. Um, these slides, by the way, should already be available to you in the directory that I've put all the other stuff in. Uh, so if you still need the URL for that, I can provide that. But, uh, and I'm glad to see so many laptops here for people who want to follow along on the R side of things. OK, so we're going to start with uh, one of the key ways in which uh, linear modeling is so different from the, the work that we talked about in correlation, this concept, concept of dependence and independence. Um, and from there, we're going to do a little bit of history just because I love that piece of it so much. We're going to talk a little bit about astronomers, a little bit about biologists, and a little bit about statisticians. And uh, one of my favorite phrases comes from somebody who's often thought of as kind of a boring statistician, so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, then we will move into concepts about linear mod that are really crucial to understand about slopes, intercepts, and residu residuals. Uh, from linear models, and then we'll finally break into a little bit of R code to talk about how, how you can accomplish these models yourself. Okay, on we go. So um, I want to start with the notion that we are, we're moving in a really different direction in a lot of respects than we did from correlation last week. Uh, you, you might remember that I said that we have a commutative property for correlations, that if you do the correlation of x with y, you get exactly the same result if you invert that and do a correlation of y with x. Correlation does not presume uh, any relationship of dependence of, of one variable on the other. So when we talk about the, the commutative property, that's saying that whether you, the order of operations, uh, sorry, the order of, um, of variables that you feed the correlation function does not matter at all. That's not necessarily true in the way that most people do linear modeling, in that we have an independent variable and a dependent variable. So we, we have a, a sort of polarity to this. If you have two variables and you do a linear model for x given y, uh, sorry, well, x given y, you get a different uh, relationship out than if you try to model values of x. Oh, sorry, do the other. If you try to model values of y given x, Right? So you can't just commute the two and get the same result. So when we talk about this, we're assuming that there is a, a relationship of dependence in that one has some sort of causal relationship on the other. Now over here, I've used a, a tiny little figure I pulled from uh, this, this website on earth temperatures. So this was asking, what is the, what is the median temperature uh, at a certain depth below the surface uh, as a function of month. So here we've got January, here we've got December, uh, and we're, we're simply asking what is the temperature on each day of, uh, for example, the brown surface, which you see has the, the lowest and the highest values, to the distance 12 feet below the Earth. What is the temperature way down in a, you know, in a deep, uh, deep underground? And you can see that this, there's a, a really strong damping on the temperature extremes as you go below ground. One of the reasons why people say, you know, building an underground house, for example, is going to save you a lot on heating and cooling because it doesn't get as hot in summer and it doesn't get as warm and sorry, it doesn't get as cold in winter. All right. So here we can think of a uh, we can think of two dependencies just straight away. We have how deep are we below ground? Zero, two feet, five feet, twelve feet, and we have a dependence on the date. So if it is, uh, if it is the, the middle of summer, it's going to be warmer. If it's the middle of winter, it's going to be um, colder, obviously. So this is a dependence. So our independent variable could be something like the day of the year, or it could be uh, the, uh, the depth below Earth's surface. The dependent variable is the temperature. So we think of, we could say temperature is a function of depth below ground and date. Uh, but we wouldn't say it the other way around, that you can try to predict what the, uh, the day of the year is based on the temperature. It's a kind of, it doesn't really, we don't think of the, the temperature as causing a date, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, the, that's the, the mental shift I want you to make from correlation where we have two values and we just want to see how they associate a commutative property 
and this we're thinking about a, a linear model that uh, uh, where there's some sort of causality relationship very frequently uh, that's part of our assumption about how things operate. Okay, so um, let us move ahead then with that that quick uh, illustration in, in mind. So. Um, uh, one of the first names that we encounter with this uh, is Adrien Marie Legendre. How's your French, everybody? Solid? <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Okay. I actually studied French in high school, so I got the chance to, to say it just briefly there. I, I thought it was very interesting that for years, um, a, a, a photo of an obscure British politician was thought to be Adrien Legendre. And so you would see this, this photo of a, a man with kind of puffy lips going, uh, in, in profile as, as Adrien Legendre, but people realized after a long time that this was actually a British politician and not a French mathematician. So um, this is a, a sketch that was made by uh, sort of a cartoonist type, uh, kind of a, a, a um, caricaturist uh, at the time uh, Adrien Legendre was alive, and I think it makes him look very fiery and uh, I would be sort of worried about taking a lecture from this guy, <laughs> frankly. Uh, so maybe I can grow my hair really bushy and uh, develop a, a stern mustache, and maybe I can have that look. But I, I think that's not me, personally. All right, so uh, Adrian Lejean. So he was born in 1752. There were interesting things going on in the world about, around that time. Uh, let me see, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was being written in my country, uh, and what it became my country. Uh, so. Uh, here we see that he became a professor in the Ecole Militaire at Paris. So, yeah, the army school, right. So he was uh, very busy working in paths of projectiles. This was a really big deal, right? If you had a cannon and you wanted to know how far you could, you could propel a ball at a given angle with a certain amount of powder in there, you had to solve some fairly difficult equations. And he got really involved in that kind of math. Uh, it turned out to have a real flair for it. But he found himself thinking above of bigger things. As scientists tend to do, we get distracted, right? So he thought, well, it's all nice and fine and good that a cannonball will go thus far if projected at this angle, blah, blah, blah. But what if we could predict when comets will arrive, you know, when a comet is, is going to return based on our sightings of that, of that, uh, of that body over time? So he, um, he realized that there was a bit of a problem. So the comet has a discrete location in our solar system at any given point in time, right? So we have, there's, there's some true position at which we see it. However, we have some measurement error associated with those observations of the comet. Maybe we know it's, uh, its orientation versus the uh, you know, kind of latitude and longitude of the Earth um, uh, to some degree of precision, but we have some error associated with it. So we have, the real, the, the real position of the comet and our estimate of where the comet is at a given point in time has a little bit of error associated with it. So he found that the method of least squares that he invented was one of the best ways to try to, uh, to accommodate this error and find the path that sort of assumes you have a little bit of error everywhere, but which will produce the least, which minimizes the error, what path minimizes the error given our observations of that comet? All right, so that's 1752, long time ago, but this method of reducing, uh, of, of working to re reduce the uh, amount of error, the square error that we have in our observations is something that has survived a very long time ever since. Um, so you can learn a little bit more about it from this history. His writing, translated from the French here, is, is actually uh, quite compelling and, and explains his mathematical reasoning for why this is a good, a good approach. And we will we'll come back to the method of least squares in a bit, but I want you to think of that as like the number one method we use for finding a model uh, that best accommodates the data we have. Okay, now uh, we get back to Galton. Now Galton was what we call a polymath. Have you heard the term, polymath? It doesn't mean he liked calculus and geometry. It means he liked lots of things. Um, so he was, he was just one of these people who dabbles in a bit of everything and just has a, all kinds of impacts. So among other things, in 1822, um, when he was born, uh, among other things, we find ourselves dragged right back into the morass we found ourselves in last week when we were talking about Pearson and Spearman, where you remember their relationship with eugenics. Well, somebody named eugenics in the first place, Galton. 
Right, so, um, so we're right back in this fine world. So where, where statistics was developing its most crucial techniques, we find there were a bunch of people who were using it to explain that poor people were just going to be poor. Yeah, it makes me mad. But, so he uh, spent his time thinking about a lot of things, not just that kind of race-baiting nonsense. He also spent some time thinking about uh, population properties. So he, he was asking himself uh, particularly about the height of people. So uh, is, is anyone here taller than both parents? You are. Okay, you are. All right, is anyone shorter than both parents? <laughs> it's okay. <coughs> I'll tell you what, when I turned 16, my, uh, my mother uh, knew how I felt about being a very, very short person. I was four foot two. Um, uh, and, and when I was 16, at my 16th birthday party, my mom put her, my mom is five foot two, right? So. So she, she put her arm around my shoulders because I was just the right height for an armrest <laughs> and said, four foot two and his eyes are blue and I just wanted to slug her. I was so mad. I hated being short. And I was like, when am I going to grow? Well, so <clears throat> I've always had this kind of worry about being a short person. And now I'm shorter than my dad and taller than my mom and I guess that's kind of how it is. Well, there, this puzzle is something that's really vexed population scientists for a long time. They would like to know why people are sometimes taller than their parents, sometimes shorter than their parents, and sometimes in between their parents in height. If it's a purely genetic trait, which it isn't, I mean, we know that nutrition matters, right? Then uh, we would expect that people would fall somewhere in between. But in fact, that's not quite how it works. So what he found, what he, he put together this principle um, that has been put together in very different ways in later generations, but this was... This was kind of like a, a kind of an early a, attempt to address this disparity in height over time. He argued that you are most impacted in your height by your direct, by your direct ancestors, your parents. But he argued that your grandparents had a lesser effect on your height, and your great grandparents had an even lesser effect on your height. So he argued that basically all of your ancestry impacts your height. Uh, and so he called this the regression to the mean, the regression to the mean, that people tend toward this sort of average behavior across their entire ancestry. Um, so uh, to, to quote him, it appeared from these experiments that the offspring did not tend to resemble their parents in size, but always to be more mediocre than they, to be smaller than the parents if the parents were large, to be larger than the parents if the parents were small. All right, so this regression to the mean turned out to be a term that uh, this, this concept of linear regression tends to, is another word for a linear model for two variables. So, uh, so this regression to the mean comes from biology, but the term stuck in the space of statistics. So here we have a nice little picture of him. All right, but I want to point out that there are a few people that you can, you can really respect in the world of statistics who had nothing to do with this awfulness of, of eugenics. So I wanted to, I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce his, his middle name here. So George Whitney Yule um, had a, an interesting take in how we should interpret correlation. He was a contemporary and a co-worker with Pearson, whom we already noted was, was pretty strongly associated with the eugenics mo uh, movement. So uh, Whitney Yule had a different take on a lot of these things. Pearson was really keen on correlation. And he said, in some respects, if you see a correlation, there must be something to it. There must be some, some reason why one affects the other. You see, he's working his way towards causation here. So he was always kind of pushing in the direction that if there's a relationship that we observe in the data, there must be some causative relationship between them. This was a dangerous point of view. So uh, Whitney Yule was trying to... Uh, trying to temper that tendency in, in Pearson quite a lot. So uh, this is not a quote from him. This is a quote from this, uh, this in 1995 writing. But his exact phrases show up in italics up there. I want you to help, I, I want to sort of point at some of his thinking. When an association leads to the inference of a direct causal relation, this is one of the things that, uh, he, that he was concerned about, where none exists, it is misleading. 
The inferred causal relation is an illusion. It is a fallacy to, an interpret, to interpret an association as if it were necessarily due to a relation. So you see, that's a pretty strong caution. Saying that someone has a fallacy in their thinking is, is I mean, I, those are fighting words in, in, the academia, in academia. So I, I, I thought it was useful to see this. So he argued that the people who were using statistics in service of eugenics were sometimes using math that made their points appear more solid than they really were. Uh, so he, he argued that we needed to be rigorous because we need to be rigorous and, and not care so much that increased rigor does, does not make these, these claims made by eugenics um, look less sound than, than the, the original publishers had. And, and he also happened to work in time series, showing that linear relationships are, are something that we can model very profitably there. Now, this is the last bit here. So, Yule nicknamed free-spirited researchers in academia the loafers of the world. The loafers of the world. I'm now in my 20th year uh, since I started grad school of, of being a loafer of the world. And I have to say, that career path has its, has its perks, right? So, loafers of the world. This is the uh, subtitle of a recently written uh, Terence C. Mills biography of George Whitney Yule, the loafers of the world. Love it. Okay, so a little bit of the history. Let, now let us move into linear models. So what is our expected value of the dependent variable, for example, grade, given the values of several variables that bear on it? So time spent studying, IQ, we already talked about some of the weaknesses of that last week, and hours required for a part-time job. Okay, so Time spent studying is something you could measure for most students. I mean, you subtract off some amount of Facebook. Do you guys do Twitter? You could subtract off some Twitter time. But, you know, time spent in front of a computer, some fraction of that presumably was spent studying, right? So we could, we could use that. Would you expect that to be positively or negatively correlated with grades? Positively. Okay, great. Um, <coughs> IQ. Can't do much about it, right? But... You have some inherent ability to remember things, to find relationships among things, to recognize patterns, blah, 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 blah. So we have, uh, again, a positive relationship. This, this value would probably be positively correlated with good and good grades, unless you're an Einstein and just get bored with everything in class and never do homework, right? So that could happen. Uh, hours required for a part-time job. Lots of people um, work in, in off hours in order to support their jobs. So you, you might find that more time spent in uh, work as a, a waiter, for example, might cut into your grades. It's possible. So we could have a negative relationship there. So we want to have the ability to model, given these three parameters, what someone's grade is going to be in, as, as a dependent variable. Okay? So we, we have these, these properties that link to causes that we think are going to have some uh, uh, bearing on what grade they get. Some of them will be strongly causative, some of them will be quite weakly uh, causative. Okay, now it might be that we see a greater weight on a variable because it's hugely important, right? Or it could be that we have very little variation within a variable and that when it reaches the higher values it has a huge and critical impact on very low values. So this weight then causes it to uh, uh, causes that, that number to scale, to, to change to a, a bigger value. Okay, so each independent variable is present at the first power. And, and further, I'm going to take interactions off the table as well. So we're going to assume that we don't need to square IQ in order to find the best way to relate it to our dependent variable. And we're going to assume there are not interaction effects. That, for example, um, that the amount of time spent in a part-time job also, de uh, also has an impact on the number of hours a student can spend studying, right? So that, that would be an interaction term, and we're not going to involve that for now. We're going to keep this relatively simple. So if we, uh, if we all hearken back to our days in Algebra 2, those fun old days, uh, see, I, I had a, a professor in, in uh, sorry, a teacher in, in high school, and when, uh, when he had a spare moment or two at the end of class, he had a, a, a big stick pointer, and he would balance it in the, in the palm of his hand. 
and then he would uh, he would flip it uh, and and catch the point uh, on his on his hand again, and he would ask you how many times can he successfully flip this pointer in the course of uh, it, you know before it falls onto the floor. It was very impressive to see. Anyway, Mr. Bolton, I believe. So uh, so back in those days, we studied lines in two-dimensional planes, right? We have an x, we have a y, we have some line. So frequently, we use the formula y equals mx plus b. y equals mx plus b. Do, do people remember that? Mm -hmm. Same letters? Okay, yeah, it's fuzzy, okay. So we have uh, a y-coordinate on this two-dimensional plane, and we have an x-coordinate on this two-dimensional plane. We have a whole series of them, in fact, and they form this line. So this form of the line means that we have a slope Right? So a positive slope means it looks upward like that. A negative slope means it's down like that. A slope of zero is a horizontal line. And then B is the intercept, which is to say, where does it cross the y-axis? Okay? So M is a slope, B is an intercept in that case, a y-intercept specifically. So in statistics, we frequently see a very similar form, but I wanted to try to translate it bit by bit. So here we have y sub i <coughs> equals alpha plus beta x sub i plus epsilon i. Okay, well that's an awful lot of terms. First off, what's this business about i? Right? We have vectors of x values, we have vectors of y values, and we have vectors of error terms. So those three are our y sub i, x sub i, and epsilon sub i values. If you have a whole series of y measurements and a whole series of x measurements and you need to relate them to each other, you just, keep in, you just have to keep track that if you're talking about the fifth x value, you must also be speaking about the fifth y value, right? That's the relationship. So when we have the sub i business in there, that's what it's all about. Now the alpha is the offset and it represents again the, the y intercept, just the same as it did in the y equals mx plus b business. And we have beta, which basically says how much weight do we place on uh, the x value for us to compute the y value. So uh, when we think of alpha and beta values, we're speaking about intercept and slope successively. All right. So what else do I need to say here? I, the, the thing that's new in the, as we move from the top formula to the bottom formula is this epsilon term. And epsilon brings us to where uh, Legendre made his, 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 uh, his key observation, which is to say that our observations have some amount of error in them. So we're going to capture that in a vector of values called epsilon. We'll come back to those in a bit. We're going to call them residuals as well. Okay, so those are the, the three terms that come into play here. We're going to move forward. Oh, here we are. Res residuals is actually the next slide. How, how helpful. All right. So in this case, we have some number of points. I'm not going to count them all. Does that look like 40 to you? We'll call it 40. We'll call it 40. So we have x1 through x40. Maybe x1 is over here, x2 is over there, x3 is up there, something like that. Each of those is a, is a, a pair of coordinates, an x value and a y value. And this line that we fit through here is the model that we're going to produce, our linear model is in effect a line that fits through this cloud of points that we've got. Now, it's not just any line. It's a special line in that it is the line that minimizes the squared differences of each point in that cloud from the line. We're going to minimize the sum of squared differences for each of those points. So that's what defines what slope is ideal and what intercept is ideal. So we have these points, we think that there's a relationship that in some way, in this case, weight leads to some property, SBP, I don't remember what it is. This is from a, a figure that I borrowed from uh, Tanya Esterhazen over at my campus. Uh, she used to use these slides when she was teaching at, at KZN. So we think that weight has some relationship to SBP such that we can, we can estimate what SBP should be for a given weight. And this line tells us what that relationship should be. Everyone good with that? I don't know what SVP is here. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, for, for me, I, I would probably put uh, weight on the y-axis and number of hamburgers on the x-axis, right? <laughs> if I eat a lot of hamburgers that week, my weight is probably high. 
My, my, my weight normally just sort of balances here. The other thing is cookies. I, I'm, a, I'm a cookie monster of the worst magnitude. <laughs> so if I, if I get my sandwich cookies, I, they don't last long, frankly. I mean, it's just ah, it's terrible. Did you guys get to watch any Sesame Street when you were kids? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, so Cookie Monster, was he was always a, a favorite of mine. So he, every time he ate a cookie, I mean, obviously the puppet didn't have a hole to shove the, the cookies into. So he would break them into these crumbs and they would just go flying everywhere. I love that. Because that's so, that, that, the memories of home, you know? <laughs> <laughs> memories of home right there. Okay. So, we start with points. From them, we infer an ideal fit line, and we can judge the quality of that line by the residuals, by these distances in, in the vertical space from our line to each point. In fact, we're choosing a line that minimizes the sum of those square distances. Okay, so this is the bit of magic that linear modeling enables us to do. I would note that the math is not easy to work, and that before uh, calculators in the 1970s, people spent a lot of time working to find the ideal values for alpha and beta for a given data set. These days, this stuff is child's play for computers. So, uh, now I have a little bit more math for us. Aren't you excited? So, we're going to pick an alpha and beta value, alpha being the intercept, beta being the slope, that minimizes the sum of squared error. You know, the first time I made this slide, I left the, the, the two off of there which would minimize the sum error. It's not the same thing. We're squaring the error and summing it together. Now, you probably remember very recently, we were talking about measures of spread in our data, whether the, the, the spread is wide or spread is narrow. We were talking about variance. So you remember that we were subtracting the sample mean from each sample point, squaring that and adding it up when we computed variance. So there's already this concept that the sum of squared error is important to tell us whether something is spread widely or narrowly. Here we're still doing squared error, but instead of comparing everything to a sample mean, we're comparing it to a modeled value, which is to say the value on that line for y for a given x. People feel good with that? It's a bit of a brain stretcher when you stop to think about all the things this line has to do. All right. So I have some R code over here at the right. We're going to run some examples of this in just a bit. But I want to start by saying that we're going to grab a uniform sampling of values across the x-axis. So I'm, I'm just picking 100 values ranging from 0 to 1 for x. In each case, I use that example. Next, we are going to model uh, that y is equal to 6 in this case. I'm giving, it, I'm, I'm giving us a known alpha value of 6 plus 4 times x, which is our beta value, plus 4. And I'm adding some normal er normally distributed error. So this is an ideal case for linear, uh, for linear regression. We have equally distributed points across the x-axis. We could make them perfectly distributed across that space, but I'm making them randomly distributed all across that space. And we have truly normally distributed error for each of these points within that line. So we know that when we do the linear model, we should get back an alpha value of 6 and a beta value of 4, because, that, because everything conforms with that. So we learn our, our, our model by running the LM function, linear model, right? It's not the only function for, for modeling, but this is the simplest one. This is just the linear models function. And we have to provide it a description of the relationship. You can read this. So you see the tilde there, y tilde x? Read that this is, you'll frequently find that you need to provide equations to R uh, for, for doing these modeling purposes. Here we are saying y is a function of x. Okay? That's the simplest kind of equation that you can get. Y is a function of x. Now, I am giving it 100 data points. Okay? How many data points do you generate in your studies? 1,000? 10? 20? I want you to think about this question. We're going to try a little exploration in it, in fact. If you have 100 data points, you can fit a line with greater authority 
than if you have 10 points. If you have 10 points, you have less data upon which to, to find your best fit line. All right, so we're trying here with 100 data points. Now, having run this model four times, I got alpha values ranging from uh, 5.754 up to 6.218. What's the true value for alpha? Six, yeah, right up there. See, y equals six plus four times x? All right, so these values should be six, exactly, because we, we know that's the value it was given. But we see that there's actually some difficulty in pegging that down. Similarly, the beta value, the, the slope of that line, we know should be four. 4.2, 3.6, 3.8, 4.4. The software has some trouble pinning that right down. If I gave it a thousand data points, it would probably get it pretty precisely. If I gave it ten data points, I would wager it would really struggle to come up with that, that number precisely. Okay, on we go. So, linear models infer a linear relationship. Do you guys, are you guys all square on the, on the meaning of infer rather than imply? Infer means that we are we're looking at the data and from that coming up with a model of it. Um, to imply something is, is quite different. Um, you know, I could imply that corruption is a serious problem ever since the current administration came to power, and then I would be implying that, uh, I, I, would, I would be giving you the information to, to say something beyond what I was actually saying, right? So inferring, inference, is the, the act here of, of coming up with a model out of the data. So linear models infer a linear relationship between a, a, between a dependent variable and the independent variables that may influence it. Oh, do you see? I got really slick there. I stuck an S on there. Independent variables. It is possible to make linear models that combine more than just the value of X. Maybe you have A, B, and C as independent variables and from them, you're trying to decide how you would best guess the value of y based on all three of those. In fact, we'll work through an example of that. Okay, next. Minimizing the sum of squared error is the standard approach to finding an alpha or beta value that minimizes this, uh, this amount of error. That's the same thing as the intercept and slope, respectively. Okay, does everyone have a laptop with R or is near somebody who does? All right. So we are going to, uh, oops, I seem to have stepped on the camera supply there. I'm going to move the camera. Well, I can, I can leave it open right there on the screen, I guess. W would, you, uh, would you operate the camera for us? Yeah, the zoom is right up there on the top. Where? Oh, the, the, just, uh, oh, this. yeah, forward and back. It's just one way or the other. OK. So uh, let us have R open. I'm going to make my screen the same in both places here. All right. Grand. Uh, let me change the size of that a little bit. And tile that vertically. OK. So I have created a script that is sitting in the directory along with everything else. <coughs> I'm sorry, there, there's a question popping up. Questions? Oh, OK. Uh, so this script is sitting in the shared drive right now. Oh. Uh, I updated it early this morning, so if you got it yesterday, it's gotten better. Um, the other thing that I'm going to be doing is running code in R itself. So uh, I hope you have R open as well. So let's start with that model that I mentioned just a moment ago. I have a uniform distribution of of 100 points drawn from uh, the uniform distribution that I'm storing in x, then I make y equal to 6 plus 4 times x plus some normally distributed error, and then I'm going to build a model from it, and then I'm going to just find out what that model object holds within it. Everyone okay with that? Okay, so you already saw the, the figure drawn from it, so uh, just ignore all that nonsense for the moment. I'm just going to paste that in as is. So R will happily generate X with no comment. It'll happily generate Y with no comment. 
I run my model equals the linear model of x as a function of y, sorry, y as a function of x. And then entering model all by itself causes the software to report on what that variable equals. So we see that uh, calling this linear model gives us coefficients. So we have the intercept, that's the alpha value, or the, the b, if you think of y equals mx plus b. And we have an x value of 4.242. So in both cases, both alpha and beta estimates have some error associated with them. So we can run that again with more points and see if that changes things. I think I'll run this again, this time with 1,000 data points. OK. So I will. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the up arrow to scroll back a few commands. And I'm going to change this to 1,000 points for x. And now I'm going to redo 1,000 points for y. You see that I have to specify that the normal distribution, I also grab 1,000 errors from that. I'm going to compute a linear model, y as a function of x. And I'm going to run model. Did that code run okay for everybody? No. What happened? I pressed something and then now shows x is equal to one. Oh, okay. Let me take a quick look. Uh, yes, x run at 100. That's good. Um, I just want to redo the model. Oh, you, you, just, you just did. You see, you run models gets linear model y as a function of x. That, that already replaced the value of model. So do I press like at zero to give it to Oh, yes, that's what I need to do. Yeah, I just, I, so you can return to the last command you typed by hitting the up arrow. And, and you can move two back by hitting it twice, for example. It, it remembers all the commands you typed, so that, that's, that's helpful. Okay, so you can see that I changed that first line to produce a thousand samples from the uniform distribution. I changed my second line to add a thousand normals as error to this equation. I fit my model, there's my model. So did we get better by adding 10 times as many data points? At first we thought that the intercept was 5.848, now we think it's 5.984. So this is closer on the intercept value, that's a good sign. So adding more data means that we have a, a, a better estimate of the intercept. Did the value of the slope get better? Its true value is 4. We started at 4.24 with 100 data points. It became 3.965 with 1,000 data points. So that's promising. More, the, the more data you use to fit the model, the more its slope and intercept will resemble the true, uh, the true slope and intercept. Okay, did that resolve most of what people were encountering with errors? Okay, I'm going to show you one other thing that's really, really useful when you're working in R. Occasionally, you just want to know what are all the crazy parameters this function takes. Now, I don't know the linear model function that well. I don't use it every day. But there's a manual built into R, and all I need to say is question mark LM. See that? So I'm going to ask it, what can you tell me about LM? And boom, up pops my web browser, and I get fitting linear models. A quick, a quick dissertation on all of the things you can do with this. So you can see that all I've supplied in this case is the required parameter formula. I said y tilde x. y is a function of x. So I gave it a formula. It needs to have data, if you have a data frame uh, that contains the information upon which you're building your model and so on. But uh, in this case, I'm just using a very, very simple invocation of it. And the very, very handy thing to know about these manual pages is that if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's almost always an example bit of code to explain how you can use it. So here we see that they've, uh, their example has a control set of these values and a treatment set of these values it shows how they get grouped together, and then it shows how you fit a linear model based on that. So, you know, I, I'm using data that I'm simulating for us to demonstrate linear models. You can also do this with true empirical data. Now, now typing it into R this way is taxing and boring. Uh, 
Remember that you can always import data from a spreadsheet pretty easily. Uh, so that's, that's a, a better option for getting the data in. Other questions at this point? Okay. So uh, let us return then to our script. So um, I want to visualize the model that I'm producing from this. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redo my 100 data point model just because it's a little cleaner. Oops. There we go. Paste that in there. So we see 6.2 and 3.53. Those are the values. I want to visualize that. So I come over here and I say plot x comma y. It's the simplest kind of point plot, right? So I have my x values. I had four, uh, sorry, 100 samples drawn from it. These, these x values should be distributed randomly over this space because they're just uniform distribution, 100 sample points. And then on the y-axis, I have uh, each of those 100 data points has a y-coordinate of being on this, not on this line, but on the, the line of intercept 6 and uh, slope 4, uh, plus some normal error along there. So the first part, plot x comma y, just produced the cloud, the cloud of points. It's the second line that's actually doing some of the work. So we see that I'm using the AB line function. I think you folks probably remember last week, we used AB line to put in minus one standard deviation and plus one standard deviation. We just said H values and, and V values to, to do horizontal, uh, sorry, vertical or horizontal lines on a graph. But AB line is also able to do slanted lines. And in this case, we're using something called the coefficients of Data, data object within the model, all right? So this is a little confusing, uh, but remember that the linear model, that when you ran that LM function, we captured it in some variable called model. And before, we were just interrogating it by typing model and hitting enter. And you remember, this stuff all pops up. But one of the fields that you can access within this is called coefficients. You see the name right there, in fact. So these two values are assumed by the, plot, by the line plotting function to be an intercept and a slope. So the, the object that you get back from the, linear model, uh, from the linear model can be passed to the line plotting function to create this line across our graph. All good? OK, so that's the first thing. How do we visualize the model that we've inferred from our x and y data points? We can simply plot it to see, does that line, does, would you say reasonably that this line resembles the data from which it was inferred? Does it look, does it rise where the data rise? Does it fall where the data fall? Is it completely outside the data points? All right, so I, I, I would say uh, that the next thing we might consider doing is to plot the line of reality on this. Because we simulated these data, we know what the real answer is. So let me see if I can figure out how to do that for a moment. Uh, all right. We're now going to step outside David's comfort zone a little bit. Uh, a, B line. Uh, and now I'm going to say C, 6, comma, 4. I really hope I'm doing this right. Uh, color equals red. Oh, it worked! I am in such fine form today. <laughs> I tell you, sometimes when I'm programming, I feel like either the greatest genius on earth or the biggest fool on earth. My R skills are rusty, right? But I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do right. So we know that the data should intercept, si uh, intercept the number 6 when x is 0. So the real, the real line, the red one, it represents the reality. This black line represents what we inferred from the data. So in this case, with 100 points, we feel pretty good about the line we inferred actually matching the reality. It's, it's hard to interpret whether a line is a good or bad inferred model from data points. Because the data are not distributed um, symmetrically around that line. Rather, this line is only being evaluated for the vertical distance for any point from it. The square of the vertical distance, actually. So this is the best, the black line represents the best inference 
inference that the system can make in order to minimize the sum of squared differences, squared residuals. Okay, so that is a start for us to evaluate our work here. Um, we're going to interrogate it a little bit more. So remember, the residuals that we got from this represent how far each data point is from the line. Okay? So we can, we can then say some points are below the line, some points are above the line. And by taking a histogram of the residuals, we get to see what, what the most common outcome was. Now in this case, we know that we added normally distributed error for 100 points. So this is a normal distribution. Did we have any values at positive 3 uh, error? No, we didn't. Not in this case. If we did 10,000 points, this would look more symmetric than it does. Okay, so looking at, a, it, looking at the, uh, the distribution of residuals, we're, we're asking how do the errors in vertical space from this line distribute? We hope that it's normal. If it's not normal, we have a problem because our linear model was fit in a way that sort of assumes that the error was normal. So when you, when you use linear modeling, if you suddenly see that this plot looks nothing like a normal distribution, you should be a little concerned about it. Okay, let us return to our assessment. We want to interrogate this model even further. We now want to say, what, did the, what does the line predict that those values should be. Are there any questions popping up? I hear people uh, talking. Yeah. I think we just all have to do Okay. The challenge in how R was behaving itself? <laughs> oh, it, it can be a little finicky, no question. No question. All right. So we are going now to look at the fitted values. This is another one of those, I'm, I'm going to make that bigger. Uh, let's see, pull that open here. Rerun that. Okay. So, the model can be interrogated in a way. We, when we plotted this line, the model had to make some estimate of where each of those hundred points that we gave it should appear on the y-axis. These fitted values are the model's prediction of what y-value we should see for each of the hundred points. Uh, now, we remember that the actual values are still stored in Y. So one of the sneaky things you could do is to plot the fitted values versus the observed values. See that? So what's that look like? Oh, it's a little sloppy, doesn't it? We would like that to be a, a very tight fit. All right. To return to our interrogation, though, we're going to use two of the summary functions that are available to us. So summary is always powerful to understand what you're getting back from a model, from, from any variable. Uh, oh, let me scoot up a little bit then. So when I run summary on this, I can see that I called it by running the linear model function, saying y was a function of x. I have residuals, I have a characterization of how much error there was in the, uh, how much difference there was in the y-axis for the observed points versus where we fitted them. I get my coefficients out, standard errors, t-values, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I get things like r statistics and f statistics for evaluating these claims as well. I'm not really going to get into what all of those mean. I need to look them up in some cases. So we see that summary, again, is giving us an awful lot of information back about what this fit is. We, th we think of the model as just a line, right? But we can also tell whether that line is meaningful in, in understanding the relationship between x and y. So the, the, some of the values that we get back in summary are very good for that. All right, the other thing... Uh, is the analysis of variance table that comes back in response to this. Uh, we have some, some concepts here like uh, degrees of freedom, etc. Is there a significant relationship between these two variables? Those things are all coming back as part of this assessment of the linear model fit.
And I find ANOVA is so wildly complex that I can't even discuss it in just one hour. So we're not, we're not going to spend a lot of time evaluating it right now. We, we should later in the, in the course though. All right. How much does the model drift from, from its true alpha and beta values if I give it very few data points? Have you ever done an experiment that produced 20 data points? Sometimes these, each replicate takes a lot of work, right? Mm -hmm. So doing 20 data points is sometimes the best we can do. So here we know that we have a simple linear fit, but we have only 20 points to make that discernment. What's our intercept? It says about 6.2 and 4.5, when the value should be 6 and 4. Run it again. 4.8, 5.6, 5.9, 4 5.5. Keep in mind that the more replicates, the more data points you can provide to your model, the more likely it is to represent reality. Here we're seeing that our intercept is walking around a little bit as we give it too few data points to really assess it firmly. And our slope is walking around a little bit as well. So more data points means that your model will, will resemble the, the truth more. But we have, to, we have to be able to provide it enough data to make that assessment. Okay. Uh, now, I wanted to point out that although we've been talking about just x and y models, y as a function of x, it's certainly possible that you may have multiple variables that all play a role. What if we were talking about, um, what if we were talking about height, right? We might have a factor as an input, gender, you know, males are typically a little taller than females. We might have nutrition as a factor. We might have genetics uh, as a factor. Maybe we take the, uh, the corresponding uh, same gender parent uh, to, to figure out uh, that as, a, as what genetics have to say. So you could use all of those factors and try to combine them all together to make your best model. Which of those is most, in, uh, most is, uh, which of those factors is most impactful in shaping someone's adult height? So in this case, I'm using two different variables, both uniformly distributed, A and B. I've made my function of those, 3 is our intercept, plus 2 times A minus 5 times B. Sometimes you can have negative relationships, right? So I'm saying that B is going to be negatively related to the value of Y, 5 times negatively. A is going to be 2 times positively related to Y, and I'm going to have some normal error associated with it, and we're going to fit a model. Now you see, my model used to be y is a function of x. Here, I'm saying y is a function of both a and b. So I'm not, I, I ran out of letters, right? So I'm, I'm saying both a and b are, uh, can play a role in, in y, and I want to figure out which one has more weight, which one uh, has the strongest impact on, on the slope of, a, of, of uh, the values. So I'm going to grab that code out, oops, and then I'm just going to run it. Okay, why am I not immediately going to produce a plot of these results? Because an XY plot is easy to do, doing an XYZ plot, or an ABY in this case plot, is a little messier. So it's not as easy, not as straightforward to, to do this, uh, this plot. But do I get linear values out from my 100 values that are meaningful? So the intercept value should be what? 3. Three. The value that we uh, inferred was 3.255 from my 100 data points. My value for A should be 2. Out popped 1.9. And when I popped out B, it should be negative 5 and it found it at negative 5.15. I'm actually pretty happy with this model. Now, when you see a linear model fit in a scientific paper, uh, do they usually have, uh, how, how, many, how many significant figures do you frequently see used? If I didn't know that the true values were three, two, and five, I might feel tempted in my paper to include each of these, oh, my intercept is 3.255, and state that as a scientific truth. But remember, 
that if you don't have enough data to pin down the intercept nice and tightly, it's just an estimate. So we should be aware that there's going to be some amount of drift on stuff like this. You can, you can estimate things like that with concepts, uh, with uh, approaches like bootstrapping, but we're not going to discuss that here. Um, so for now, we see that we have these estimates from our data. If we were to rerun this with an altogether new sampling, we would find that those three numbers had walked again on us. So these are, I, I want you to know that linear modeling is useful for finding this tendency in a relationship where we believe one variable is dependent upon another, but that they also have some error associated with them. And it would be crazy for me to go out to eight significant figures on these things when they have a lot less uh, precision than that. Okay, so I hope that's a useful introduction to linear models. Uh, I believe next week we move to difference testing, so I think we'll have a, a really enjoyable time talking about uh, t-test and u-test. So, uh, all right, any, any other questions on linear models before we close for the day? All right, thank you very much, glad to see you all today, and I'll see you next Thursday.